welcome. And uh, before we really start, uh, we want to give you a short numbers. So here's a little little one, and uh, this one is, is counting up uh, uh, since some time now. Um, yeah. So if if any one of you ever uh, work with platform as a service, this is what uh, the, the website Pathfinder org I found uh, states as the current um, number of providers for platform as a service, which is quite impressive. I didn't expect the number to be that high. And I don't know if it's complete, but at least uh, yeah, from what the website uh, tells us, uh, they are all active and can be used in various stages. So you can filter like for alpha, beta, or production. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's quite an impressive number. And uh, if you look at the Google Trends, it's yeah, constantly increasing. Um, so we are right here now. Uh, so people have a high demand on this uh, stuff. And uh, this means for whatever uh, decision you make, uh, for whatever tool you choose, it is most likely you will, uh, the tool you really need will appear after that decision. Um, yeah, that's uh, up front. And now to, to our real talk. Uh, the, the talk is called How to Build Your Own Cloud While Staying in Business. This sounds kind of kind of funny, and uh, maybe you can complete some of your bingo cards today if you uh, haven't already done it yesterday. Um, yeah. So, what what does it mean? First of all, it's it's great that you showed up uh, that earlier in the morning. Mm, I hope you already had uh, your your first coffee. We did uh, at least uh, one. Okay. So, uh, why are we doing this talk? Um, First, first thing, we don't uh, give this talk to, to make you feel bad about anything. Um, we would just want to take you on, a, on our personal journey through infrastructure and uh, shipping software and uh, hope you can take some, some of this uh, stuff with you for your own project. And uh, yeah, as you may, may have guessed, it's about infrastructure. Um, and uh, yeah, one thing, it's, it's, it was true for the last year, and it's uh, maybe even more true uh, this year. If you start a new product and need to, uh, and you're in charge of, of infrastructure decisions, it's really hard. The, the, the field is really, really complex and vast. You have a, a ton of options. It's really hard to decide which options are good for you. Uh, most of the time, you don't have uh, enough time to evaluate all of them. Uh, or have any idea how to evaluate them? It's yeah, it's a, not an easy task. Maybe 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, you just got your root server somewhere, put whatever Linux distro you you preferred on it, and you were good. And yeah, nowadays the, the field looks uh, quite differently. Uh, but it's fun after all. So at least for us, it's it's fun, um, and uh, we hope to can uh, give you uh, yeah the impression why why it's fun for us. Um, because Docker, Docker is, yeah, when you're talking about infrastructure, not talking about Docker is ha hardly possible nowadays. Uh, and Docker is really great. It's a great, uh, um, it's a great ecosystem with a lot of solutions and options, uh, how, how you get your, get your stuff done. Um, uh, but it's, it's a, uh, it's all one vendor and it's kind of a vendor lock-in. And today we want you to present some, some other options, how you can, yeah, choose from, from different uh, approaches and not only rely on Docker. Uh, that said, we, we like Docker, we, we use Docker in production uh, and, and for other stuff, and uh, it's not to discourage usage of Docker, just to show some other options. Um, yeah, and there's a Task Warrior uh, workshop going on right now. So you're not there, so you already know that you have to get things done, and we have to get things done as well. Uh, and yeah, all of us have to create some business value in the end. Uh, it's not all about fun. You have to create something that that can be shipped and that produces some yeah, value for, for whatever business you're running. Uh, and the pursuit for perfection is a noble quest, and it's fun as well. But sometimes it's uh, not uh, yeah, not well placed in a business uh, environment. And pragmatic solutions are not bad at all. Uh, and yeah, as I already said, we are, we are loving this, this stuff. So we are uh, both uh, infrastructure and software developers by heart. Um, and we want to give you the impression that 
yeah. You, uh, after this talk, you can go home and don't feel bad about your software you, you built yourself and don't feel bad uh, about uh, being 10 years behind what's going on in the rest of the world um, because, yeah, the, the bills are always greener on the other side, but we all uh, just start somewhere. Mm, okay. Um, we have some challenges and opportunities nowadays. As I said, I said earlier, doing infrastructure nowadays is it's kind of hard, but yeah, we have some opportunities as well. So first off, uh, the challenges. There's an increasing complexity. Software stacks are getting bigger and bigger, so you put frameworks uh, uh, over frameworks, and um, yeah, you not only have uh, backend frameworks, you have uh, really complex stuff going on in the front end as well. All this has to be put together somehow. Um, the, a lot of abstraction layers. Uh, you have your development environment. You have something where you have to, to test all the stuff. You have production stacks, um, staging stacks. Yeah, you name it. Um, you have maybe running something, uh, some some of the stuff in the cloud. Some of them is uh, on dedicated hardware uh, in an old data center. Some some maybe in house. All of all of this uh, at the same time. You get uh, you have de different um, environments for your developers. It's uh, yeah. It's quite options uh, to choose from. Um, yeah, and, and still we have to innovate some, somehow, right? So we have to, to move forward and create new stuff and make things move faster um, and stay attractive to new developers is also a very uh, yeah, crucial task for, uh, for most businesses. You know, not running old and boring stuff, but yeah, attract new people with, uh, with new fancy stuff. It's all, yeah, all quite, uh, all quite complex. But there are, uh, as I said, some opportunities. Uh, we got infrastructure on demand now nowadays. So if you imagine, yeah, uh, you got got uh, the various cloud uh, providers. Uh, it's not only servers. You got message queues. You got caches, databases, everything on demand, uh, paid by the hour or by usage. So you you're really flexible with this. And uh, to use this in a flexible way, it's, uh, they, they most of the time come with an uh, API you can use to automate stuff and uh, put together programmatically. Um, and uh, the, the hardware nowadays is really powerful, so uh, there's no, no really a limit regarding uh, the, the, the power of hardware, at least for, yeah, for the average business, I guess. Uh, if, you, if you're Netflix, uh, you obviously have different uh, problems. But uh, for, for most projects, uh, the hardware out there is, is uh, suited well enough for, for everything. And um, with this comes, we, can, we have to find other ways to, to use this hardware. And one, is this, uh, uh, one, one way to use this is virtualization and containerization. And uh, there's even something unique kernelization, which all aims to uh, get the most out of your powerful hardware. And at the same time, the hardware is really cheap, um, relatively speaking. And um, yeah, those are our opportunities. And uh, that's why we're doing this talk. And uh, I told you why we are doing this talk, and we didn't introduce ourselves yet. Uh, um, and that's us. Uh, that's me on the, on the left. I'm Dirk. This is, uh, uh, Sebastian, also known as Bascht. Um I'm doing mainly mainly oper um, development, and Bascht is mainly doing operations. And magically, we're doing DevOps. Um, okay, and uh, Bascht will take over. So one second, we have to change the microphone now. Right. Sorry about that. So, I'm just gonna go with that. Okay. Um, all right. And in the same way that we ruined Scrum, it only took us a couple of years to ruin like DevOps. So, just so you know that we are like really certified. Uh, you see, I do have a badge. It says certified DevOps. It's Comic Sans. So you know, so you know it's real. And. So just to take you on our journey, I mean, uh, the last slide said uh, Dirk is the developer. I'm doing operation stuff. But come to think of the last like few months in Java, uh, Dirk mainly does operations, and I'm failing with Rails. So um, it's really it's not like we have any clear borders. Um, 
And like in software engineering, infrastructure engineering is a lot about tools. So this whole conference is probably about tools. So you have like separate tracks for different, different languages. Uh, so people don't start fights. And let's have a look at those tools. Um, I mean, it's not for uh, not called infrastructure engineering for no reason. So uh, we have like a small slide prepared, and we you can yeah. I'm just confused by keynote. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, what is going on? Stop it! Stop it! Wait a second. I got this. I got this. All right. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, take a moment to appreciate the handcrafted animations that Dirk has done. So, um, uh, as you can see, there are a lot of tools with all different kinds of scopes and goals, and they all do have their right to exist. And it's not about like competition there; it's more like coexistence and like integration, uh, either vert vertically or uh, horizontally. So, uh, infrastructure and its tools are kind of moving closer to the developer. I mean, if you've been in the like operations field for more than five years, you've probably seen a lot of trends come and go, but if you've monitored what like Docker was for um, operations, uh, you see like trends evolving from the uh, developer side of stuff. So uh, especially since like the uh, um, ascent of Go uh, language, um, uh, developers start like, uh, the tools start moving closer to the developer. And at the same time, um, you have concepts and paradigms of the developer tools that have more inf uh, influence on the infrastructure tools. So um, we have to sort out all this mess. I mean, um, if you took a look around, you probably used like at least one or two tools from that slide. And the thing is, everybody likes to have the one tool you know, that one tool that they are, like, really like to use, so be it Docker, be it Puppet, be it like another fancy new tool. Uh, and it would be really great if there would be the one tool that solves all these problems. And the thing is, I'm gonna take you onto like a small quiz. Um, so just think of one tool that you really, really like. So think of anything you've run your infrastructure on, any IDE or anything that helps you ship software to production. And then just set in that tool into the blank and read that sentence out aloud and then think about if that would be still true. And I suppose if it, if, if it helps you run software in production, that sentence will still work. We're gonna resolve the quiz at the end of the slide, so, but just, just uh, for the sake of the game. And the thing is, um, no matter which community you come from, they'll all like they, they will all look like they are the same tool, uh, they are the, the one tool. And they could be the right tool for you, but they might not be the right tool for another person. So um, we are both from the Ruby community, so for us, for example, Chef or Puppet are the way to go, because it's code we understand, whereas you'd probably choose Ansible if you're like running a Python stack. So it's all a matter of like choosing the adequate tool. Um, yeah, that was the slide that should have come for what I was about to say. <laughs> um, so, um, after all, it depends on like using the adequate tool for your job. So you have to, to you have to solve your problems, and you have to you have to have tools that move out of the way uh, of solving the problem. Um, and so. Just a, just a small disclaimer um, for what we're about to talk about. I mean, you've already read it probably in the abstract. This talk isn't sponsored by HashiCorp. We are not endorsed or affiliated with HashiCorp. We just happen to like the tools that they, um, that they ship. Um, but um, this is not even bound to like specific customers. We both do freelance um, development and operations. Um, but it all depends on like getting like the right tool and the right software and the right, right pipeline to the customer. And you know, all you're about to hear is uh, like subjective. So the stories we tell you might not work for you. And there's also one key thing to keep in mind, objects at conferences appear better than they are in real life. So no matter what we tell you, no matter what other talk will tell you, just like yeah, take a few steps back and think about. And whenever 
I want to hear like stories from like the old Ruby days. Um, we gather around the campfire, and then Dirk will take a whiskey and like tell us what the old days of development were like. So let's go there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how many of you are uh, Ruby devs or do, doing Rails stuff. Um, I started with it really early, and uh, my my place to go whenever I needed to set up a new box or install uh, for for a colleague or a friend um, the Rails stack, I went to Hive Logic, and uh, Hive Logic is still it's not not uh, really active anymore. Um, the block uh, of Dan Benjamin, now famous for podcasting uh, various stuff. And yeah, I, I, he um, regularly updated uh, his articles for new OS X releases, new uh, Rails releases, Ruby releases. And um, yeah, you had a, a really long list on how to download everything, compile, set up your compiler on OS X because it was not that uh, easy um, um, at that time. Um, yeah, and eventually I put some of them in, in scripts, and the uh, scripts will fail on another machine because I forget something, and yeah, it's, it's, it's really a, a, a brittle stuff. Um, but then there was uh, Vagrant, and uh, I could run Vagrant provision, and had one machine to rule them all, and I could share them, and give them to Bash, and uh, to, to other people, um, do workshops with them, and oh, we all had the... Uh, the same machine, and it was a happy place after all. Um, but the, the question remains, how did this provision stuff is going to happen? Uh, still uh, some, some scripting put together. Uh, and because I'm only a developer, uh, I should tell you how this, this provision step behind the scenes will operate. And we have to switch again, sorry. Switching part is wrong. Just switch bands. All right. So let's see how Keynote works out for me. Um, so in the old days, um, you had like manual processes all over the place. So like Dirk said, you had some, some hopefully had some readme. You hopefully had some abandoned wiki page from like three months ago that worked then for one machine. Um, but let's not go there. So in the same way that Vagrant changed the game for developers, Puppet, or Chef, or Ansible, or Salt, or CF Engine, um, like brought salvation to operations because um, I remember like six or seven years ago when you would like watch Puppet like magically provision and set up and deploy machines and it was all the same with me. Like Dirk told you, you would just like run Puppet apply and it's all like butterflies and rainbows. So in the same way that Dirk experienced this change, the operations side also experienced this. Okay, we have this tooling, we have like, um, we have to solve stuff by automation, and um, we are all happy. So um, that was our talk, thank you. That's probably not true, but um, you know, in the same way that um, Vagrant brought like the app, the like developers closer to uh, the operations side, Puppet brought the operations people closer to the developers in the way that they had to think about source control, they had to think about versioning their software, they had to think about um, releasing stuff or rolling back changes, all kinds of stuff that wasn't really like any heart of the operations pattern. And it's all, all in all, it's just like mundane infrastructure plumbing. So um, let's have a closer look at how development really worked then. So, Let's say Dirk has an app that should be developed and deployed. Yeah. This would better. There's two mics. Um, yeah. Inside my uh, my vacant box uh, that was set up by uh, by Puppet or whatever, I would run. Uh, I would go into my million dollar app and just run rake build. Yeah. And uh, out will come a Debian package with my million dollar app uh, package and ready to, de uh, to uh, be deployed. Okay, so uh, let's have a closer look at this. So I have my code, I compile it. In this case, yeah, for, uh, for all of you who know Ruby, there's no real compilation step, but 
you, you could argue that uh, building a Debian package is kind of a compilation step, and uh, out of it comes an artifact. So it's the same is true if you're if you're uh, having a Java project and there's a Java file you can can move around. Uh, the, the, the key is we will get one artifact to to move around to deploy somewhere. So forever uh, the same inputs, uh, I will get the same artifact, right? And uh, whenever I uh, change some parameters uh, in my uh, in my code, I will get an, uh, a different and a new artifact with a new version number. And even if I change just uh, just a typo in yeah in in a config file, I will produce a new artifact. Uh, and so and uh, we will uh, skip the <laughs> switch back now because now it's the same coming for. Yeah, we're sorry. Sorry about the microphone situation, but so um, so in the same way that Dirk told you what would have happened if he'd gone into the into the box and um, just started Rake, he produced the Debian uh, archive, and in the same way you'd have operations writing code that would say ensure that that's that's just puppet, but think of any generic um, deployment or uh, configuration management. Um, in the same way that he did an artifact, uh, we have like the ensure latest uh, that will take sure, make sure that the artifact of Dirk is really the latest version that's there, and we'll ensure that the service is running. So um, you now have like two different code bases kind of like tangled together, and it's in the, in the end it's the same thing. You have your puppet code, so you'll not really compile it, but you'll interpret it. And in the end, you have one artifact, which is your uh, server. So kind of like what the Debian archive is for Dirk, like the actual, be it a Docker image, be it a VM, or be it like a real like um, machine, is kind of like an artifact, because you've run code that will that changed state on that machine. And even if you throw away the virtual machine in the end, it's, it's a, kind of like an artifact. So even if your application is a monolith or like really, really cluttered together, the infrastructure is already built of a lot of different building blocks. So even going for, with microservices won't help you there. Um, if you think of like the, um, like your stack you have, I think you have a monolithic application there, so that's not a problem, but you have multiple layers of networking. You might have databases. The databases might have storage attached to them. Uh, you might need monitoring and locking, and that's, that's quite a lot of building blocks. And running changes there uh, will at some point become either a, like, like a real pain, or you just like can't be bothered to just like run Puppet anywhere where things just worked. So um, those are all artifacts. So no matter how you put it, it's you run software, software changes state, and you have to deal with this. And I fear that we are switching back again. Are we? Not yet. We're not switching back again, so I can keep the mic. Um, um, let's see. Yeah. So your average system may look something like this, and we're not even like talking real microservices here. This could be any sufficiently simple app that has like two or three different kinds of like libraries included might have like runtime dependencies might have like dependencies to different versions of a database you're using um, in the end you end up just like with a real real mess of dependencies of artifacts of code that's coming from anywhere be it like Ruby gems be it uh, uh, Python archive, and there's like no real way to put it. Then this is really, really finicky, and there's not a real solution to this problem. So, some problems got solved by configuration management. Some problems were solved by giving the developers a real good tooling. But in overall, things are like still finicky. So, uh, let's have a look at the downside. The complexity increased uh, with giving developers more tools with like um, modeling your infrastructure as code. Um, because like back in the days, you'd only like throw it over the wall and the ops guys had to take care of it. And um, the changing running systems, which is something that still happens there. I mean, I, I do run Docker in protection. I do like 
know what it means to have like infrastructure <laughs> that you treat as cattle versus like pets. But let's be honest, um, you probably haven't thrown away your production database over for a new release, or um, you still have your monitoring system uh, upgraded. So we still have to deal with running systems. And bootstrapping is still a mess. So um, if you've seen somebody like bootstrapping a puppet server with Puppet, um, that's still not a good thing to look at. So um, we still have like a real mess, um, and we're not even sure if we've covered all infrastructure components, even if we say it's infrastructure as code. Uh, we, we've come to realize that more and more infrastructure is acting like software, and we need different kinds of approaches there. So what we really want is like infrastructure as code, not just some of it. But let's see how we get there. So let's have a look at the like the real problem. Uh, we're switching again. Yeah. Okay. So um, every of those boxes uh, Bas showed earlier, uh, you you probably will all check with with any platform as a service. So at least if it's uh, yeah sufficient enough. You, you all, all uh, get this uh, when you go to, to one vendor. Um, but as we told earlier, we don't want to present one vendor, um, but give you a, a feeling of how to, to put this up uh, yourself. So whatever, uh, whether you are doing it yourself or not, uh, at least it is at least good to have an understanding of uh, how these building blocks are coming together, even if you're using a pass. And uh, yeah, still using a pass, you you got a kind of a vendor login. Uh, you, you have at least to be aware of, uh, or have to know of that that, that is, uh, is um, there. Uh, if it is a bad thing for you, you have to decide on your own. It's um, uh, there's no no law that says vendor login is a bad thing uh, uh, as itself. Um, so we uh, we will present you a, a mix of tools and services you can use to to make this work um, on, on on its own and without relying on a uh, on a pass. Okay, um, so a, a pass checklist would be we we want to have a dev production parity. So both environments, ideally, uh, they they should be identical. This is kind of hard in our experience. So. Because in development you want some more information than in production. For instance, you want to have debug log enabled, and if you change this configuration, does it mean they are still the same, uh, even if you disable it in, in production? And if you're talking, if you are um, talking about changing even one one tiny bit in your configuration, producing a new artifact, you're running a different artifact in uh, development than in production. So this is a kind of a hard thing to to accomplish, but you, you want to get as close uh, to that production parity as as it gets. Um, Obviously, you want to have repeatable builds. Whenever you get this code compile artifact step, this should be automated as good as possible. And uh, yeah, not depending on uh, whether Bash or I compiling it, and the artifact will be a slightly different um, um, result. Um, the next would be uh, that we want to track those artifacts. Uh, so we have to have some kind of registry uh, where we can find uh, our artifacts and look them up. Immutable infrastructure would be great. So what Bash presented earlier, all these little boxes in, inside your entire stack would be uh, changed uh, upon any, yeah, even the smallest change uh, of configuration. Again, this is kind of hard for, for your database. Uh, imagine throwing away your production database uh, if you have to, to tweak a parameter. It's kind of sucks. Um, yeah, and you want to cover the entire stack. So from not only uh, the web servers, but you want to have a network uh, integrated, um, yeah, configuring your network, databases, storage, logging, monitoring, everything. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, we pre um, present a tool for repeatable builds. And uh, yeah, who knows, it's from HashiCorp. Uh, and we, we like to use Pucka because uh, Pucka is a flexible tool. It can build for various platforms. You can even build Docker images or provision bare metal machines. You can run it on all uh, of, of the major cloud providers. Um, yeah, and that's what we talked about, having a flexible tool for, for different use cases. And um, so how, how does this look? 
Uh, it's JSON. It's not uh, really well readable right now, but yeah, I hope you get a glimpse of what's happening here. So we somehow define what type of machine we are building. In this case, we're building a Docker Docker machine based on the uh, Ubuntu image. Uh, we, are, we are running some uh, <coughs> uh, some post processing, or, and that is to, to push it to the Docker registry. Yeah, whatever, uh, be it our own internal or public registry, that depends. And uh, the parts in the provisioners block is left empty because we always showed you that. So there would be m running a part. And the result would be a, a Docker image, and um, anyone in the team could run this uh, command and will produce the same Docker image. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. It will be a Packer build, and that's it. Okay, and that's but but that's only one one tiny building block, right? That's only builds uh, one server, be it uh, the database server, the logging server. We do, still don't have it uh, interconnected, and uh, yeah, we need uh, as I said, we need to have as, um, uh, DNS set up somehow, databases, all the networking stuff. Uh, yeah, and that's where Terraform comes in. It's uh, also from, from HashiCorp. It's also like Packer tool that integrates well with different uh, uh, providers on a different scale. So the AWS support is really vast, for, uh, for instance, and other providers don't have that um, good coverage. But overall, you, you find uh, yeah, for the major um, uh, vendors out there, you, you can get uh, any, uh, some kind of integration. And uh, <coughs> So we have this uh, Docker image set up, and uh, now we we need uh, to have some kind of security groups. This is AWS specific, but imagine this as a firewall rule for, uh, for our database. And we um, got our database, and this has to be get to, uh, a username. Um, yeah, and we are choosing uh, Postgres for the engine. Uh, yeah, um, on the on the plus side of this, this is uh, already documented, so you can just read it. Even if you're not familiar with AWS, you you get an idea of what's happening. And again, we can um, we can just uh, execute it repeatedly. So in this case, there are two steps, but uh, that's not really important right here. So first, we we plan what changes will be applied to the infrastructure, and then we actually apply them. So you have to a chance to intervene before uh, destroying your entire stack. <clears throat> um, yeah, and uh, now Bust will continue. All right. So, as you have, might have noticed, uh, no user interface or UI or graphical UI was, was harmed in the making of our artifacts. Um, all of the tools you saw like our independent uh, Unix style tools, you can just like integrate into any build pipeline, CI server, you name it. I mean, think about um, just picking one tool and interchanging that part of your pipeline uh, for another tool. You could have at any point just like used CloudFormation for provisioning AWS. Um, now, if you've seen the different artifacts, let's see how they are deployed, like run, connect. And that's where Nomad comes in. It's like distributed, highly available data center where scheduler, that's a lot of words uh, that trigger uh, microservice uh, consultants. But um, in the end, it's just like a software that makes sure your software will run in a way that you want it. So um, remember the million dollar app? We now have like the app artifact. We have like the infrastructure that the app will run on. And just now we have the same like JSON style-ish configuration language uh, that will make sure that this app is deployed so to our like German, Austrian, uh, Switzerland region is deployed to the, like those different data centers. Uh, and we have our front end that will spin up like another front end Docker image that we've built in another pipeline. And say it will spin up 20 um, front ends of that kind. So um, think of like Terraform as an, and if no think of like it as a transformation of an artifact into a running service. So like Nomad interconnects your infrastructure with your actual services that you run. So for now we've checked a lot of boxes. So we have like dev production parity, at least for that, those parts that we've modeled into our code. Um, we also have repeatable builds. Um, uh, we have the 
real immutable infrastructure because for now we didn't touch anything like manu manually. Sorry. And so maybe you've noticed um, there's still nowhere. Um, uh, you don't, don't find like service discovery here because that would just like um, terminate like the end of our talk. So um, we leave that part to the avid reader. Um, but if you remember, like a few minutes ago, um, our little quiz. So you've just like replaced it in your mind, remember? And let's resolve the real um, solution. Um, this is Simkey we're talking about. Does anyone know what Simkey is? Does anyone remember what Simkey is? Okay. Um, I had to look it up this morning as well because the slides are a few months old. But Zimki is a hosted JavaScript environment that went on the O'Reilly radar about 11 years ago, right? So in 2005. So just remember what he told you earlier. So objects at conferences maybe may appear better than they are because this could have been Docker. This could have been any fancy tool that you've encountered in your last like 10 years of software development. And we're talking about a tool that is gone probably since eight years, so nobody even remembers it. So just like take everything you see with a grain of salt. And also remember um, our little formula we gave you earlier. Um, by the time you decide for a tool, um, any proper tool will definitely come after you've done, you've done that decision. So don't even bother. Um, in the end, it comes to a few rules. So just like don't like buy anything from the one tool sales people. So even if like say Docker comes with batteries included but interchangeable. So if you put in your own batteries, you might set your house on fire. So just like evaluate what's really good for you and what works for you. And if it works, it's probably a good solution for you. Um, also look out for open and like pluggable solutions. Um, and um, the most important part, I forgot my t-shirt. Dirk cut his t-shirt on. Appreci <laughs> appreciate the parts of the infrastructure that really work. And so in our little chat room, we had a small like, uh, yeah, saying that it's uh, like good wie butter, like good like butter. So we have a seal of approval. And I guess, do we have stickers? No, we don't have stickers with us. <laughs> uh, yeah, but in the end, it comes to appreciating like the tools in your workflow that really work. So those are the solutions that work for us, and they might not work for you. Um, in the end, just like appreciate like the small tools that you already have, like evaluate stuff, and uh, yeah, have a good day. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we do have a few minutes left for questions or discussion. Do you have a microphone? No. Okay. Yeah, yeah I can repeat the question. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, how do we deal with bugs in the tools? Um, I mean, the tools we introduced uh, are open source software. So in the end, it comes to like reporting it, or like in nine out of ten cases, just like finding like the actual issue already open on GitHub. So. Um, in the end, um, it's just like keeping up with the major updates um, and uh, having a close look at the bug tracker. It's probably all I can do. I mean, what would she say? Yeah. Um, yeah, and finding workarounds. So whenever there's a, there's a bug and you, you need this feature, you, you still want to uh, have the tool around, um, yeah, have a workaround. So I, I for yeah, my, myself, I have plenty of workarounds for, for different bugs that will be fixed later on. And yeah, you have just to work around it. It's like uh, any other software, right? So in the end, there's no, no silver bullet to, to deal with bugs. But I don't think it's a, it's a good option to just abandon the tool because there's a bug inside. You have, yeah, uh, see, is the tool actively de uh, development, uh, in active development? Uh, other responses on the mailing list and the bug trackers and, and stuff like that. And, and if not, yeah, think about changing the tool. But uh, if there are uh, issues addressed, um, yeah, find a way to work around it to the next release, I guess. More questions? All right. Then, yeah, thank you. Bye.